Okay, good morning, everyone. It's still morning. Uh, welcome to the labs and infrastructure session at this CSIC conference. Uh, we've got two events in this session. The first will be a 50 minute panel on research data software infrastructure for the long tail needs, barriers, and solutions. And after that, we've got a talk from Neil Jaitman, research themes, autonomous agendas for IC labs. So I'll hand over to Nicola Knight to run the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to give a little um, brief introduction to sort of what we're going to be doing in the panel. Um, you can obviously see we've got a bit of a background slide up here. Obviously, if anybody joins us later on, they'll be able to get a little bit of an introduction into what we've got. Um, we're going to start off also with a bit of an introduction from each of our panel members uh, to give a little bit of a background on sort of their um, interests in the area and what they um, do. So obviously, um, with sort of RSE and the background of the people here, you wouldn't necessarily know what we imply by sort of the long tail. Um, so what we're referring to in this is like a lot of the long tail communities. So these will be people maybe in universities or research institutions um, that work in a really diverse selection of research areas, um, small research groups, maybe individual researchers, um, or people in highly specialized research areas. Um, so often these are the uh, sort of research areas that aren't covered um, sort of by large projects or large facilities and research infrastructures. And they often have um, very differing sort of data sets or data needs and often they can be um, potentially sort of not their needs aren't met by some of the um, large scale um, projects or in infrastructures that go on um, so we're going to be discussing in this panel kind of how we can um, explore these needs and barriers for those communities in particular but not necessarily exclusively um, looking at that and how the RSE community and other data focused initiatives um, can try to sort of help those um, communities or um, adopt um, sustainable solutions to address them. Um, so we are going to be doing this quite informally. So obviously we've got um, our four panelists up here, um, but we do really welcome input from the audience. Uh, so we do have Slido, which hopefully by now you are all familiar with, having used it in all of the other stuff. Um, so we welcome contributions in the form of both questions and comments as we go along in the discussion um, as a bit, just a bit of logistics in order to help us run it and like separate it out. If you have a comment that's kind of responding to something that's going on in the current discussion, if you could just like start your um, entry with comment um, and then we can hopefully pick it up in the current discussion. But if you have something that's like a separate question, if you just start it with question, then we'll know that we'll pick that up as a separate one. Um, so I guess we'll get started and just do a bit of a brief introduction. Um, so obviously, uh, as introduced, so I'm uh, Nicola Knight. Um, I'm going to be uh, chairing this panel or mo moderately chairing this panel. Hopefully it will somewhat chair itself. Um, I'm from the University of Southampton. I'm an um, enterprise research fellow there and I work on the physical sciences data science service. So I'm not actually a developer myself, um, but I provide uh, data resources for the entirety of the UK academic research community. Uh, we mainly focus on resources that are within the physical sciences, um, but obviously these resources are open to all researchers who do academic research. Um, so that's currently where um, I work and we're looking at how we can connect up um, data sort of existing data infrastructures and broaden the reach of these um, data resources for the wider community. Uh, so next I'm going to pass over to James Gibby, um, our first panelist. Hi everybody, I'm James. So I work at STFC in the scientific um, computing department. Um, I'm a computational scientist sort of by trade, uh, but what I spend all my time doing is supporting two national consortia in biomolecular simulation with scientific software development, HPC, you know, exploitation of that kind of stuff. So my my interest in data really is because working with lots and lots of research groups around the country, I see that, you know, we're basically still living in our caves in the biological uh, biomolecular simulation um, field. And, and I know that there's good precedent in other areas of biology, um, as some of you well know. Um, and and it, my interest is purely just trying to get some of those best practices into the field. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Alejandra Gonzalez Beltran, and I lead the. I also work at STFC, but in a different um, campus. So I'm in the Rutherford Appleton Lab, 
and I lead the data and software engineering group there. Um, and our main remit is really work with the facilities there, so larger scale scientific facilities such as uh, synchrotron, uh, um, particle accelerators um, and lasers and work with them on their data management. So our group works on building the, the software that support the data management activities of the facilities. In addition, we also have uh, other projects uh, supporting and working with uh, other researchers in, in their data management issues and their software um, sustainability issues, uh, like collaboration with the Met Office, with the Scottish COVID Response Consortium, uh, etc. Um, and my interest, uh, so I've been working on, on data management for a long time, on data representation and the software that is required for this and vocabularies. Uh, I'm also um, working with the W3C on uh, vocabularies that help on data exchange and data interoperability like the data catalog vocabulary. Uh, so yeah, I'm also interested in looking at uh, not just this big data that we are handling at the moment, but ca how it can be linked uh, to uh, other research data uh, to make to get more value out of the data that is being produced. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Simon Coles. I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of Southampton, and for the last 30 years, I've been uh, helping deliver uh, a national experimental-based facility um, that. Well, it provides crystallography data to chemists, physicists, material scientists, um, and addresses quite a lot of the long tail um, in, in, our, in terms of our definition here. Um, in, a, in a parallel world, uh, for the last 20 odd years, I've been trying to pioneer um, digital underpinning uh, in science in general. Uh, be that through tools, resources, uh, etc., and that's kind of led to the uh, to, to leading the uh, Physical Sciences Data Science Service that Nicola m mentioned. Um, and more recently, we've been lobbying um, funders uh, to try and set up a proper data infrastructure for physical sciences. So if James reckons biosim people are still living in caves, physical scientists haven't actually yet evolved to walking stage. Uh, we're, we're way behind uh, <laughs> even that, that point. Um, so. Uh, not only are we looking technically to set up a data infrastructure, but we've got to do quite a lot of hearts and minds um, work to get um, this long tail researchers on board. Okay. <laughs> I'll hand it back. It's going to get uh, particularly annoying. Um, okay, so um, we've had a brief introduction from each of our panelists. So now we're going to get started on the questions. Um, obviously, as we said, if you do have any questions you want to ask or any comments you want to make, please uh, join the Slido and hopefully then it will start populating itself up on the screen and we'll also be able to see it um, on the computer here. Um, so in a lot of the discussions that we've been having um, throughout um, the, pa the sessions and panels over the last couple of days, um, there's been quite a lot of discussion around um, the ways in which uh, RSEs or the support can be given uh, based either on sort of people who are quite specialised or people sort of who are quite general. And I guess this also uh, reflects in the support that would potentially be given to long tail researchers, whether or not this would be done on sort of an individual kind of specialized bespoke basis, or trying to make this more general and bring it into a much um, bigger kind of more centralized kind of infrastructure. Um, do any of you have any um, sort of comments on sort of whether one of those approaches would be better than the other or something like that? And I'm also guessing the best way to do this is if people kind of raise their hand potentially and then we'll uh, th fling the mic um, so um so i mean the main characteristic is of the long tail research data and what we call that is that is small data uh, and very granular and very diverse and so it's characterized by its heterogeneity so given that i think if we mm, we should focus first on the uh, domain agnostic representation, but especially on helping researchers uh, seeing the value on, on research data management and how this is valuable for them on their own labs. Uh, I mean, let alone, uh, so we, I think we need to talk about research 
data management irrespective of the data being open. So that could be a later stage. So this is an important process for, for their own labs uh, and especially recording um, general metadata. And then, I mean, each individual um, domain may consider the, its options, but I think we need to agree on on representations that enable exchange of data and interoperability later on. So that's uh, setting the foundations for that. I, th I think from my um, experience, m many um, physical scientists um, feel they're unique uh, and individual uh, and that it's not possible for them to fit into an infrastructure. So there's a there's a socio-technical uh, problem here with getting these long-tail researchers um, to understand the values of data management, as Alejandro was saying. Um, and it's the it's the value to the individuals, and they need to get something back um, if they're going to invest in um, engaging with a, a large-scale infrastructure. So generally, these people are looking for tools to help them in a very specialised way. So they, they would like specialised support, uh, and the issue we have is to try and uh, get them engaged with a, a larger data infrastructure. So I think having um, you know, platforms that g provide general purpose um, value um, rather than specialised would be a, a good way of getting that started, because we do need to shift it, you know, very specific projects for the entire long tail um, is not a sustainable way of moving forward. So. Uh, we kind of need both, um, but an infrastructure to, to plug these specific projects into so that they can um, provide value. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say as well as a sort of extension to what Simon just said is that's potentially where uh, programs like COSEC and the RSC programs could play a role to try and translate these sort of uh, generic resources into different subject domains. Uh, I don't know if that's a potential. <laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of, um, I guess, one of the first sort of things, yeah, is obviously building the tools that are quite generic or something and then adapting them uh, for specific um, kind of the bespoke uh, where required, uh, but as yeah, as sort of it might might not be a required potentially as much as some of the researchers potentially think it might be because actually um, they may be more similar, although different terminologies potentially or different things, but can be mapped um, more easily um, to different areas. Um, so. I think I'll take one of these questions uh, from the audience, which um, is asking about an overview. So um, it's asking, can the panel give a quick overview of sort of the types of data that is being shared and consumed um, and how they are accessed? Um, so I think obviously this would be um, a quite, quite a diverse thing, but uh, maybe just a little flavor of some of the different um, data that is um, we're being talked about. So I can give you a, an overview of the life sciences area where I work. So <clears throat> the the data is largely, um, I guess, the life scientists themselves think about the outcomes of simulation. As a and as a, a community of scientists that are a massive comp consumer of HPC, we produce masses of of, of output data from si you know simulation. But actually, probably more important than just that alone is actually all the data that goes into creating these models. So I've been at the sort of blunt end of projects where I've been developing new methodologies where, you know, PhD students are moved on to postdocs and they're uncontactable. And then, you know, we just get given a whole bunch of academic papers to reverse engineer and we can't even reproduce their results because, you know, when they create their models, they make lots and lots of little decisions and that know-how is in their mind. And we just lose all of that because in the papers, people typically don't write this kind of stuff in the papers. So, you know, being able to capture the whole process through to whatever input data researchers are starting with all the way through th to the simulation outcomes and analytics would be a really useful thing for us as a field. Um, well, just to mention on the o other data types, so we work more on the photon and neutron data and although this is potentially first, not the long tail. Um, so we we do archive um, 
all the data that comes from the facilities and we are collaborating in different projects um, we, to agree on common APIs. So for example, the Expanse project um, that collaborates with Panos. So these are two European projects looking at the, um, the national and the European uh, research facilities for photon and neutron data. So we've agreed on a common API uh, to search the different uh, metadata catalogs. Um, so then, uh, so also this means agreeing in, in some of the shared standards. So there are formats that uh, are being uh, agreed as well as vocabularies to describe the data. Uh, so this might not cover the long tail, but I think it could, there is certainly lots of data in the long tail, even on, on those communities that we are not um, necessarily supporting, I mean, this is up to the researchers. Um, so the, the, any derived data that uh, on, uh, from analysis or any uh, modeling uh, is not necessarily being um, archived or, I mean, the, of course the researchers are encouraged to, to think about these things on data management plans, etc. But yeah, we, we have to do a lot of work in um, in the cultural change of um, doing this as a day-to-day -day, uh, task. Okay, so, so if asked um, what data is currently being shared in physical sciences, I'd have to say not a lot, um, very little indeed. So in this area, um, researchers are driven by publishing. Uh, so data being, they, they consider data being shared um, as part of the publishing process, so invariably the data is kind of locked behind subscription paywalls and mainly assembled in PDF format and, and entirely un, uh, unaccessible. Uh, so they, they will only generally share um, that which is demanded uh, and as part of the publication process. So um, the supporting information, the supporting data to a publication can be immense. You know, the paper might, uh, a nature paper is often uh, like four pages. The supporting information can be 100, 200, 300, but it's completely un unaccessible. Uh, in my field, crystallography, there's, there's, there was a realization all about 50 years ago that aggregating crystallographic data into a collection uh, would enable science uh, and, and drive new discoveries, etc. Uh, and for a long time, it's been demanded as part of the publication process, if you've got any crystallographic studies, you must deposit your, your data into a, a centralized database. And that's worked really well, but it's about the only thing that's worked really well um, in, the, in much of physical sciences. So uh, um, the mindset at the moment is to conform to the publishing um, demands the publishing process um, and very little more. Uh, so there's, there's a whole culture um, change required there. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, it just all sounds so fantastic, the data that you guys are working with, but I just wanted to say that it doesn't look anything like that, even as good as was just being described in, in crystallography uh, at the end that I work at, which is, um, I mean, I work a lot on, on disease modeling and um, with a lot of lab scientists, and I get emailed thousands and thousands of Excel spreadsheets, uh, often in zip files that get bounced by our servers, um, and um, uh, because they might have a virus in, and apparently we don't know how to do virus checking. Um, and so, and there's no metadata, the spreadsheets uh, often have multiple tabs, many of which are incomplete or they never got around to filling them in or, and then we have to parse these to try to work out what's actually going on. And this is WHO collaborating centers. This is, you know, major international institutions that are just randomly emailing me Excel spreadsheets and they have to email it to my personal account because the university keeps on blocking it. Um, and, um, and, you know, and this unfortunately is how we manage data. They don't have, you know, when we go to their to, to their labs, um, there's just a flat directory that has every single spreadsheet of every lab assay they've ever done back to the 90s um, in one folder. Um, uh, and that's that's it. So so the whole concept of APIs and downloads and metadata catalogs, um, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, <laughs> we don't. <laughs> plus, uh, yeah, yeah, plus, plus, plus another. Um, what I would ask, actually, in response to that, is, is whether there's any kind of um, overarching, organising um, 
union or, or body um, that, that that this community kind of conforms to or falls under. So the way crystallography went about this 40 or 50 years ago is that the international union uh, said right we will need to sort this out they defined a, an interchange format and uh, and and devised this database system so it was kind of it wasn't imposed from on high um, but an organization that represented the community that saw value in sorting this data management problem out by setting standards etc um, was the way forward Well, then you need a way of being able to incentivize the use of those standards. So, so I work in biosciences as well, and we have standards. We have, as Alexandra knows, we have an enormous number of standards, uh, which um, is, I'm sorry, I've just been interactive for a moment. <laughs> Breaking your model, sorry. Uh, yeah, spontaneously. Um, because it's okay having standards, but you need the mechanisms in order to be able to have those standards adopted, but also incentivized. So I work with um, a lot of genomic data, omics data, and there's a whole range of well-established standards around that. But you still get the problem of the, the project comes to an end, they want to be able to deposit it because they have to deposit it in one of the standard deposition archives in order to be published, and it's still a pile of crap Excel sheets, which then somehow you're supposed to retrospectively through, I don't know, divine intervention and telepathy, figure out what on earth it was supposed to be to retrofit it to the standard. And that is not often not feasible, actually, because they weren't collecting the data right. So there's something wrong about how we're getting it at the very beginning of how to collect things at the very beginning in the appropriate ways. And is it wrong because we haven't got the training, we haven't got the incentives, we haven't got the, um, we haven't got the infrastructure? I don't know. Um, that's the question I'm asking the panel. I mean, sorry, I'll give you the microphone back in a sec. But just just to follow up on that, the, the I mean, there's a big issue with for us that that we work with WHO, FAO, OIE, who are all big international organisations. Like OIE is actually quite small secretly, but they, but but. You know, and so and and across tens of thousands of labs, all doing similar but not the same assays, and and uh, and and it just, I mean, who? I, it's not remotely clear who would set that standard, because uh, because you know it's very hard. I only know of one occasion when WHO, FAO, and OIE have agreed on something, and that was on canine rabies elimination, and and you know and that was driven by some collaborators of ours, but but that was that required setting up. Uh, a charity to act as a pressure group and then putting people into WHO and putting people into FAO and putting people into IE to drive the agenda in each of those organizations to then set up a common agenda. So how you do that with these massive international organizations when they're, they don't agree on most things? I have no idea. I mean, it would be great if we could work it out. <laughs> yes, um, well, of course, I mean, uh, First of all, I wanted to clarify that even on 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 the mentions I made of APIs, etc., it's not that it's all solved. So the data really that like, we can archive, and some of the facilities have open data policies and are making data open, and that's why the data could be available via APIs. Is mainly uh, the data coming from the machines. Uh, so this is all the raw data that is being produced. Uh, but we do lose track of the subsequent analysis and data that is being produced that is the one that is important for publications. So even in those communities where there are some there is data available there and there are APIs or we are building them, I mean, uh, as we speak, um, it's nothing is solved. Uh, but yeah, I totally agree that uh, there is also the problem of uh, not even having standards uh, and providing motivations for that. Uh, but I think we should look at the incentives that this makes your everyday life as a researcher easier um, and you are able to, to share data, even if it is only with your collaborator, I'm not saying openly, fully openly necessarily, especially if it is health data. So. Um, yeah, I think we need to find use cases that pr show that those incentives and, and convince people that they need to agree on a standard. And that, of course, it, it in itself is a huge undertaking. Um, but um, that's why we could rely on the domain agnostic uh, elements 
as a way in so that then different communities can uh, then devise their own specific um, bespoke elements uh, in the in the metadata. And I, I'm really happy that we're interacting. I, I'd rather do that than, than just uh, the slider. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to pick up on Carol's point of incentivization um, in terms of picking, uh, of adopting standards. Uh, it really does come back to giving value to the individual so that they buy into it. I, I agree. Um, I think the way it, ha it worked in crystallography was hiding the standard, if you like, but it enabled um, softwares to be chained together so that you no longer had to painfully uh, enact a workflow. It will just happen seamlessly under the hood. Uh, we developed visualization software, which meant you could look at your data uh, rather than it just being kind of ones and zeros. Uh, and uh, we, we turned the, the standard into a, f a format that uh, enabled publishing. So you could publish the data as a standalone object, all the provenance of how that data were generated was automatically recorded. So, and then we did this in like in the 1990s. Uh, the, the, the format, the standard enables you to do everything in the subject area, but it's all completely hidden. Uh, you don't have to interact with the, the, the format of the standard yourself, the tools just enable it. And that's all thanks to software engineers. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think some of the stuff around um, sort of um, demonstrating this benefit or getting the buy-in because uh, some of these um, areas, there are already existing tools or there are systems that could be implemented. Like I think there was a comment about saying that the most common uh, exchange format is email, um, which is probably for a lot of the places um, probably true, maybe not even necessarily helped by COVID um, because obviously in a lot of the sort of labs where they're doing even it was paper-based research. And so obviously that wouldn't even get transformed into the digital uh, world, let alone then stored in the correct format, able to be shared. And obviously the um, transition into COVID tr changed a lot of that stuff, not necessarily for the better, maybe more digitally, but it was very rushed. Um, and so a lot of that stuff potentially went to, yes, just sending somebody an Excel spreadsheet via email and then uh, not having any information around it. But there are some aspects of, uh, I guess, good research data management practices, um, uh, uh, generic tools that are able to be used, but potentially people either don't have the training or don't realize how it could impact their work. Um, do you have any sort of thoughts on how we can potentially either um, bring the communities maybe together to realize those benefits or um, mechanisms through which we could um, provide sort of training um, in those areas? <laughs> Um, well, I think, I mean, indeed showing use cases of how this works and especially uh, pointing out the benefits on your day-to-day -day, uh, research by having well-organized data that uh, are not a hard drive full of files that you don't know what they are uh, is fundamental and provides support on, on setting up uh, those practices. As well as I think it is very important to have um, tools that help to either extract metadata from, from the files themselves uh, in an automated way, if that's possible, and especially making sure that if we ask people to input metadata manually, that that is not lost and it happens only once, um, so that they, don't, uh, they aren't asked every time to, to input the same information. So in terms of... Um, yeah, I think we do need to build tools on, on that take care of that uh, and provide uh, the general training on research, the benefits of research data management. Yeah. <laughs> training is an interesting word. Uh, I'm not sure I'd go that far. If, if you have a system that you need to train people to use, then you've probably not done your job very well. <laughs> um, it, it should be r intuitive and easy to use. So I think we're, what we're talking about here is a bit more, more like advocacy. Uh, realizing the benefits of, uh, of, of doing this properly. Um, and one approach, again, I think is, uh, is around giving value back um, to individuals. So if you buy into this, then you get something back from it. Uh, so for example, if you manage your data um, correctly in this system, we'll be able to 
you know, at a press of a button, you could have the appendix to your PhD thesis um, automatically assembled, or this, uh, this, the supporting information to a paper is all just there. Uh, or as a supervisor, when your student has dis you know, left five years ago, you can still pick up, easily find the data, understand it, uh, and write a paper about it. Uh, that kind of advocacy um, that, that illustrates the value to the long tail folks, especially um, uh, at a personal level. You know, what, what do I get out of it? I mean, you probably don't need much training. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, very good. And I think there's a, a comment I saw that came up that is uh, saying about that um, it's really important that data researchers don't see data management as yet another thing that I just have to do on addition, like on top of all of your workload. And I think that's really important um, because in terms of doing all of these uh, potentially introduction of new tools or new systems, um, what it should do is enable the researchers to get more out of their data to be able to do more with it without having to put in more like the effort up front um, so that they can actually get that benefit because obviously all the research they already have so much stuff to do with their time and all of these admin things um, that their those systems should be able to kind of almost not be seen um, and so I think that's yeah, really important that it isn't just oh, another layer of kind of admin that goes on top of it. Um, one of the comments that we you sometimes get in terms of obviously a lot of data um, coming out or potentially being published more and things is about data quality um, and the ideas around um, data curation. Um, and so one of the questions is around sort of data curation, like kind of workflows and stuff is um, would sort of researchers be expected to carry out some of the curation of their own data or do we need to um, bring in um, data professionals to provide this aspect of data curation and how would that fit into kind of the data publication ecosystem? Um, so I think, so the researcher is ultimately the, the expert about the data. So I think their input uh, in terms of curation and this annotating the data, making sure that the, uh, the metadata is available so that is understandable by others. Uh, it is important, so they input by their researcher. At the same time, if we look at the broader aspect, so that we want these annotations to, uh, especially within a repository, for example, uh, you want to have uh, harmonization across data sets. Uh, and then uh, I, I do think we do need professional curators that uh, have the knowledge of the vocabularies that are used for annotation and especially that they look after the this common view of um, of a repository so that you can um, use the same term to find different data sets or find the commonality uh, across data. Uh, so I think it's a, a collaboration. So curation should be a collaboration between the researcher and, and someone specialized on, on these annotations. I feel pretty strongly that we uh, do need data professionals uh, in, involved in the curation process. Uh, and, and much like the emergence of RSEs 10 years ago, I think we need to campaign for um, career data professionals uh, and support for them. So yes, I think there should be um, curation uh, services provided by experts. Um, a lot of institutions already have people who are experts at curating things. They're called librarians. And uh, I think uh, an evolution uh, of the library systems in universities um, would be uh, a, a one vehicle by which you could actually get this out there. So um, being able to coordinate for particular communities at a centralized level, but training librarians to support locally would be the way I go about it, to be honest. In the mind, sure. <laughs> Yeah, um, I have to. I'm an ex-librarian now working at ESRC. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just sort of would encourage people to speak to librarians because we are trained on the metadata and standardisation. But the issue is that lots of academics and RSEs don't realise that librarians have that expertise. So um, yeah, anything that can be done to encourage sort of um, working with the librarians in your universities is very a very positive thing. Yeah. <laughs> 
Can I respond to that? Yeah, absolutely, please. Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of librarians, and I work with our librarian community of uh, open open science. But I want to push back on that because our librarians are trying to cover so many disciplines. So they are typically we have a very small group of librarians who are trying to do data management, and they can't hope to know. You go to them and say, oh, "Well, what's the right standard for this kind of proteomic data?" How are they supposed to know, right? Uh, so you can do librarianship support for general stuff, like preservation or high-level metadata at the DCAT level, for example. But you can't do it for the really deep knowledge that you need in order to be able to reuse the data. So you can use it to find it, but you can't use it for, for reusing it. So I, I'm, I'm supporting Simon here about um, the professionalization around specialisms, because I think one of the things about the, uh, the, tr the training and the state of stewardship is that the argument is, oh, we'll get the libraries to do it, and then that it'll all be all right. And actually, what we need to do is to have profession large professionalized groups within research performing organizations that have can deal with all the different specialisms which coordinate with the library. Um, otherwise, you just get this, oh, we can shove it off into a couple of librarians and that'll be all right. And it, and it isn't all right. It's not all right for the librarians, actually. Absolutely agree. <laughs> There's nothing I want to say in return. That's, that's absolutely spot on, Carol. Yes, I mean, I agree as well, because you do need the domain uh, knowledge to be able to annotate uh, data sets, as we, especially with, the dom of course, the domain specific elements that allow you to, uh, to be more transparent and eventually reproducible with, with your data. So. Uh, no, I'd rather give to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I work with uh, in Alejandra's group, but uh, also do some stuff for CEDA, which is based at RAL, which is the uh, Centre for Environmental Data Analysis. Um, they're set up to uh, manage all the data, environmental data for the whole of the UK. So that's from, uh, they're taking all the, the feeds from ESA, so you've got all the satellite imagery coming in, uh, we've got all the observational data from the Met Office, we got climate projections from the Met Office, down to sort of individual experiments from universities. So we store all, all environmental data. And to do that, they you know, there's a large metadata catalogue and they have a team of data scientists which then know all about the vocabularies. You've got the NERC vocabulary server, which you've got loads of vocabs to deal with all the environmental data and we've got people in CEDA that are helping to manage that and you know it's it's a big group and you need that sort of center for each different discipline I would say you know it's, it's sort of coming together and getting everything amalgamated there and you know I, I'm sort of on the periphery of them I do some work with them but yeah, you know, and so I see some of it and you know they, they it's taken them a long time. They've had a lot of investment for government, and yeah, even now there's there's always room for improvement. And they um, for APIs and things that they they're trying to get as much metadata into their metadata catalog, and then they're providing numerous APIs onto it because different parts of the community need to follow different standards. So as long as we've got all the the metadata, then you're just providing different interfaces. So you've got the various interfaces for data.gov and then other stuff for need other people, open search and uh, elastic search interfaces to it. So that's what I say. Yeah, I, I agree. The way that the environmental sort of NERC community uh, go about this is good. You, you describe one data center, there are another seven, right? <laughs> um, I think what's, there's a horses for courses um, point to be made here. I think that works in environmental science. You can, um, you can have, centers focused on particular goals um, and that well there are eight of them and that generally has quite good coverage for most of environmental science or most of the NERC community. I think in other disciplines like medical and life sciences uh, different models need to be employed so it works well for the environmental science community but I'm not sure that those kind of um, monolithic centralized uh, centers uh, work for other 
communities. What you've actually done technically is great, uh, and we, we kind of need that sort of stuff in other in other disciplines. But I'm not sure the way it's set up um, works. But the amount of money uh, and the amount of organisation you need to put in needs to be reflected in other other councils across uh, UK. All right, that's for sure. Cool. Uh, so I'm looking at the time and we have actually whistled through the majority of the session and we have about, I uh, think, just about 10 minutes left. Um, so I we've kind of talked a bit about some of obviously some of the issues, some of maybe the ways it's handled in different areas. I was kind of wondering about maybe if we think sort of a looking maybe a bit kind of forward to the future, maybe ideas. So what can maybe as the communities, um, so the, uh, maybe the RSE community in particular, also audience, we welcome participation from you guys as well. Um, what can sort of the the RSE communities maybe do to sort of move forward this support for the long tail or what can we try and encourage the long tail to do to interact with RSE communities or other communities? Obviously, we've discussed a lot of this is not necessarily just the technical, but also kind of the social and the awareness and advocacy um, angles, very complex and large um, topic areas. Um, but what do you think some of maybe the either next steps, uh, short term or longer term um, should be? I don't want to take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'd like to see is, is kind of a, a, a registry of RSE's uh, expertise um, because we are going to have to do specialised uh, developments for particular uh, members of the long tail, if you like, um, but you can't do that as individuals uh, and lots of little projects doesn't really work. So I think we need some way of understanding what expertise there is out in the RSE community that so that we can kind of and this is uh, this is aspirational now that that that's doable um the aspirational bit is uh, would it be possible but for institutions or organizations to kind of share that rse expertise so we need to set up this thing uh, in southampton but the expertise is in i don't know york um can we hire in someone from york for a bit um to to help us sort out our uh, uh, the situation in southampton um so some kind of hub uh, that advertises the expertise and enables us to kind of uh, exchange that expertise and use it optimally uh, around the country uh, to address different problems. There's quite a lot there, but some basic starting points as well. Um, yeah, I think I, ag I, I agree with that, but also I think that RSCs as collaborating with researchers in their software needs um, they are also well positioned to help on making the software interoperable uh, by the use of um, of common standards. Um, so I think that's something that uh, that could be. Uh, so the expertise between RSCs and collaborating with researchers by making inputs and outputs interoperable, uh, and it, it's a would be a, a, a good way forward. And they do have so RSCs uh, in different groups do interact with researchers in different domains. Um, so I think this could be a starting point. Of course, maybe there is more, the need to share more um, about what those standards should be and, and, and discuss uh, in terms of, uh, first of all, agree on, on things, generic things, and then uh, start looking at the specifics for each uh, domain. So this is really broad, so uh, it's not something that is sorted um, overnight, but I think, uh, yeah, we should also look at the interactions between software and data when we talk about these things, uh, because the, the whole point is making the software sustainable uh, and be able to um, inspect the research data in the longer term, so, uh, and, uh, and not changing formats on, or uh, changing ways of accessing uh, the data. Cool. Um, are there any comments from anybody in the audience that they'd like to make? So I think some of the comments that have been flying past are really relevant. Uh, and, and I pick up two. The first is that um, RSCs are really an important bridge because what we have is an extensive set of standards, an extensive set of computational infrastructures and data infrastructures. And at the European level, there's a shed load of stuff, but none of it's getting to the 
long tail researcher. So, uh, and the long tail researcher doesn't have the time, capability, um, isn't given enough time actually by their supervisors often to to engage with it. But the RSCs are instead of trying to uh, trying to approach researchers, let's approach RSCs because RSCs then can be the important bridge that will link up what they're doing with these infrastructures. Because uh, at the moment we have this this last mile problem that we don't have, you know, you have great infrastructure, but the last mile means that you can actually use it, it just isn't there. And the RECs can do that. Um, but that also means that we need to advocate for the RECs being engaged in the development of what makes it possible to do that last mile. And I think somebody, was it you uh, put, put in that comment about RECs have to get involved in the standardization processes? Uh, that wasn't you. Oh, well, you done lots of good questions so I thought it was you uh, so um, was it you oh great it was a great it was a great point great point uh, so that means the RSEs aren't just the oh now you have to deal with what you get they become part of the conversation and they become part of the journey and that often means they're not allowed to, to do that um, by stupid ideas about RSEs are just servants they're not they're actually co-creation partners <laughs> um, I was going to make that point if I got the microphone back, actually. So thank you, Carol. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Um, being um, part of the uh, the design process from the outset, um, or even from the point at which you make the proposal and say this is what we intend to do, um, is is really key. Uh, so I think there's a there's a cultural um, point here where organisers of these uh, big infrastructures uh, or, or projects need to fund and bring in RSEs right from the very, very beginning. Uh, yeah, I think that's really key. I think there's been a couple of comments. Unfortunately, I think my one uh, decided to not update and then suddenly update with a whole bunch of comments in it. Um, so there's been a, yeah, a couple of really good comments about um, the, I guess, integration of RSEs um, across kind of the sort of the pipeline because obviously um yeah as carol said like they're the people who have the expertise in a lot of the um the technical aspects of it and obviously that the researchers don't really have the time or necessarily the knowledge to be able to understand all of the um sort of technical um arena but they know their domain um so getting that um the integration between sort of the rscs um and the infrastructures and obviously the domain um, sort of experts, um, I think is really important. Um, so I'm just quickly scrolling through um, some of these comments. Um, so I think there's a comment here that I would just quickly address. So somebody commenting about uh, sort of researchers being let off data management. Um, so I don't think that was the intent behind our comment about um, things being sort of easy to do. It's more that it should be become sort of not necessarily automated but it should become part of your sort of daily routine or your sort of thing at a level where you don't have to actively go and spend hours and hours formatting your data and transferring it into this format and then transferring it there because it needs to be in a different format to go into that repository it should become seamlessly integrated um, and that way it doesn't become an additional burden um, but instead so now like obviously things like spreadsheets are completely integrated into what you do it won't take you longer to use sort of stuff like that um, so that it doesn't become something that's significantly on top it's just more integrated into what you can do with your normal time um i don't know if there's any last points there anybody i just want to say a really big thank you to you all for sort of um joining in in our um panel um there are obviously uh, more comments that we had time to get through because you think 50 minutes is a reasonable amount of time and then it whistles by um in no time at all um so we will be able to get hold of all of the slido comments after the fact um and um use some of these comments as well in kind of our summary of what we've discussed um, in this panel session today. Um, so I don't know if any of the panelists have any just final words that they'd like to say as we wrap up. 
Um, well, maybe just to uh, shout out to the importance of RSEs and uh, data stewards as uh, and collaborating on uh, on achieving this. And uh, and I think, I mean, even though there are lots of um, variety on different domains on how far we've got into this, I think we all need there is room for for improvement in all domains. Uh, so I mean, I think as long as we uh, take it a step at a time um, and and also encouraging people by um yeah um making uh, more value on the so giving more value to the data even in small steps and that should be rewarded in in every domain so i think that's the the steps we need to take and indeed is the the collaboration between data and software on on making this possible yeah i'd just like to point out that data infrastructures and data-driven science is something that researchers are now waking up to uh, and asking for. So tying together existing data infrastructures, building new ones, um, is all going to be something in this coming decade, basically, uh, and it will be impossible to do without good RSEs getting involved. Thank you very much.